Spotlight is proudly sponsored by HEC Media, St. Louis's home for arts, education, and culture. You can live a strong and resilient life. It's just really like the best community ever and it's like made my college experience what it is. It's a wonderful thing to have that no other city in the country has. Today on Spotlight, meet a leather artist who's bringing back a craft that was popular in the 70s. Plus, the big league impact Cardinal pitcher Adam Wainwright is making off the field. And then a creative arts hub turned nonprofit organization, how this place helps children. But first, a look back at Prom Magazine and maybe even an answer to a popular St. Louis question. It's Sunday and you're watching the multiple Emmy Award winning Spotlight. In downtown St. Louis, this year, prom season is all year. have a remarkable special collections department uh, and a lot of St. Louis memorabilia. And one of the things that we have is a collection of prom magazines. It was one of those St. Louis things, a monthly magazine all about high school life, published from 1947 until 1973, and now brought back to life in an exhibit at the Central Library downtown. That was St. Charles Normandy Riverview, St. Louis University O'Fallon too. I remember I used to get my prom magazine at Sturgis Drugstore at Grand and Lafayette. Couldn't wait for it to come up. And often it was sold out. Despite the name, it covered much more than just proms. It was not hard-hitting journalism, but it was certainly comprehensive with column after column featuring gloriously alliterative names like Melville Murmurs, Shamanad Chatter, and McKinley Message. Turn the page and you could get the minutes from Mercy, the notes from Normandy, and find out what's cooking in the Kirkwood kettle, a sort of social media before social media, but without the bullies. Everybody doing that a high school bop. They come from Cleveland, some it equipped and trained reporters at each school. Every school had an official prom reporter and was given a camera. That was the only way you could get a record of what was going on at dozens of high schools across St. Louis. And everybody wanted to be a snip, which means see, name, in prom. So they hound these reporters, put my name in the next article. And it came out every month. Prom Magazine was started by Julian Miller II as a second career after dabbling for years as a songwriter or in advertising, depending on who's telling the story. But advertising was definitely a big part of Prom Magazine's story. It was a big commercial enterprise. You know, the 40s, 50s, America had discovered teenagers as a great market. So one of the things that you see in Prom Magazine is the beginning of tailoring advertisements to the subject. <laughs> Playing off the name of the magazine, the exhibit includes vintage tuxes and gowns, sorted by era, along with lists of hit songs, also sorted by era, and a bulletin board where visitors can post their own high school memories. We actually had a prom here in the Great Hall of Central Library to kind of kick off the exhibit. We invited anyone in the community who wanted to come. On a wild, stormy night, we had the Great Hall filled with people wearing their prom dresses from the 40s and 50s and 60s and 70s on, and they all had a wonderful time, and we got a lot of questions about, you are gonna do this every year, aren't you? And the staff was going, uh... <laughs> It's, it takes a lot to put on a prom. The exhibit also addresses one particular question about that question particular to St. Louis. Some local historians believe the high school question was born from curiosity inspired by reading Prom Magazine. I don't know that you could prove it, but it certainly didn't seem to be that case before Prom Magazine. It got to be more important because of Prom Magazine, because of pulling all these people together. Despite the fact each issue cost only 10 cents, Julian Miller managed to keep the magazine profitable enough 
to stay in business for a long time. But by the 1970s, Prom Magazine's 1950s sensibilities no longer made sense to most high school students. In 1973, Prom Magazine folded. It really does look like an outtake from the Leave it to Beaver show to me sometimes, but it does seem to be generally a fond and excited and uh, positive memory for most people. Thanks to a donation from the St. Louis Media History Foundation of a few back issues and lots of professional photos taken for prom by Philip Hasser, the library now has almost every issue digitized and available online, turning what was meant to be a throwaway magazine into a time capsule. This is a nostalgic city. Prom has been gone for 50 years, but uh, still that memory lingers on and, and to today. And it's a wonderful thing to have that no other city in the country has. It really did a lot of good and brought a lot of attention to high schools in St. Louis. On display through January 7th, 2024. Visit slpl.org for info. Ultimate Frisbee, later on Spotlight. So my name's Kristen. I'm a leather worker in St. Louis. I'm originally from Massachusetts. I moved here a couple of years ago and now have a brick and mortar um, on Jefferson. So I use all traditional leather working techniques to create modern and minimal leather goods. It's a craft that used to be really prevalent in like the 70s and has died out over the years with like fast fashion, but there's a slow reemergence. And I just think that's really exciting to use this craft that has been around for ages and employ traditional techniques to put my own spin on it. So I craft leather bags. I do a lot of crossbodies, backpacks, small accessories, wallets. So I started leatherworking because I wanted to make bags for myself, so I was really my first customer. So I use traditional techniques, but my leather bags are a lot more feminine. I use less traditional leather colors and leather types. To make my bags, I basically start with a design. So I have designs that I've created and cut out, and then I go ahead and pick the leather hide that I want to use. I sketch it out, hand cut, glue, stitch, and then I do a process called saddle stitching. One needle goes in one hole and then there's a needle on the other side of the thread that goes into that same hole as well. It creates a really durable stitch that can't be replicated by a machine and that's something I like to preserve the leather craft. Art fairs are a huge thing that keeps my business alive. Um, I think especially with leather, it's really good for the customer to be able to see the bags in person. You can touch the leather, smell the leather. It's a very tactile product. So um, it's harder to make that translate online. And I love when people can come into my booth and see the products, try it on, see me working. Often at art shows, I will bring stitching. So I'll be working in the back and then they can come in, ask questions, and they can actually see me at work. So I can't wait to see you at Lohmeyer. I'm really excited to share my work in person with you and I hope to see you soon. Today is the last day of the 2023 Laumeyer Art Fair. Get out and see Kristen's work until 5 p.m. For more info, visit laumeyersculpturepark.org slash art fair. HEC Media. Recognized. Celebrated. Honored time and again for excellence in the industry. Find all of the award-winning content at hecmedia.org. Since 2005, St. Louis Cardinals fans have relied on the steady, dominating presence of ace pitcher Adam Wainwright. When he's not throwing curveballs to big leaguers, he's giving a helping hand to the community with his charity, Big League Impact. Big League Impact is a charity that my brother and I started in 2013. We like serving those who don't have the basic essential needs, food, water, shelter, education is a small part of that, and then medicine. The things we take for granted every single day. There's a lot of people in the world living meal to meal. There's a lot of people in the world wondering where their next sip of water is coming from. When I first started working with organizations that were alleviating those problems and were actually saving lives every single day, 
it was very impactful for me and it felt like something I wanted to do more often. But not just do more often, I wanted to bring other people into that. I wanted to show them that vision because of the incredible athletes that we get to work with with these giant platforms. We like to show them that vision and, and that mission that we have at Big League Impact, but we also love empowering them to go out and figure out what their own passion is and to go out and do great things in their own communities. We've done projects all over the world, but also here in the United States, we've done projects in St. Louis, we've done projects in South Georgia where I live, we've done projects across the country because of all the athletes that we've worked with. The very first mission trip I went on to see some of the projects we were doing was in Honduras. I wanted to go there, film what we had done so I could bring back the news and the evidence that what people were giving to was actually making a difference. And so this one village we went to, I was about two hours inland from the coast of Honduras where we landed. When we arrived, we drove into the community we were serving. There was the entire community, 1,500 people out waiting for us to arrive with posters that they had made from all kinds of reeds and all kinds of other things, uh, welcoming us. They couldn't wait to show us. So this community, it's up on the top of these hills, and they would travel two miles down the hill every day to this only water source that they had. And then they would travel two miles back up the hill with these 40-pound water jugs on their heads. Now, if you go to that, we installed this wonderful water project with the help of a group called Water Mission to the very top of the hill, and then we ran 20 taps around the community so that nobody in the community had to go out more than 50 steps outside their front door to get clean water. And that's the thing, it's not just water. It's not just having a water source. What's in the water source? What are they actually able to drink and get out of it? Because so many times that water is just completely infested with cholera and a lot of other different uh, waterborne illnesses. And so we were told within three or four months, 80% of the waterborne illnesses were completely gone in that community. And then as soon as I saw that, I was able to take not just the pictures back, but that story and the, the people I met and the babies I held and this life-changing stuff. Along with his charity work around the world, Adam has also helped inspire the charity work of local artist Stephen Walden. Stephen's so talented and didn't even know he was an artist really until a few years ago when he started doing this as a hobby. And then all of a sudden, wow, what a life-changing thing for him. But also now he gets to serve and and it's not just our charity, now he's doing a lot of work with other charities as well. And he has a great heart and a great mission to serve others and help others. And, and so we're glad to have him be a part of our team. This past winter, Adam hosted a charity concert where he performed another one of his passions, music. Could there be a Grammy Award in the future? <laughs> Man, I hope so. That'd be great. That'd be uh, that'd be something cool to share with my family and the world. But one thing at a time. We're just trying to. Hopefully, people like the music. It's so far, so good. Everybody seems to enjoy themselves when they come out to the show. The other day, they had a blast and liked the music and liked the songs. And so, I'll just keep doing that. We'll see what happens. Among his accomplishments in Major League Baseball, the most personal came in 2020, when Adam was voted as the winner of the Roberto Clemente Award, which recognizes an MLB player who best exemplifies the game of baseball, sportsmanship, community involvement, and the individual's contribution to his team. The Roberto Clemente Award was the most prized award that I've won in my career. What he led was just was so much more than just on the field. It was how he was able to help his community, his fellow Puerto Ricans, how he loved on people around him. And just for the betterment of humanity, really, that's how he lived his life. And so to be in that conversation with people like that, with the great legacy that he left, was a, a tremendous honor to me and something that is the biggest award that I've won yet. Whether on the field or off the field, the legacy of Adam Wainwright and Big League Impact will continue to affect people around the world for generations to come. With every stroke of the bow, every stroke of the brush, with every stroke of genius, the arts make life in St. Louis richer, not just emotionally, but also economically. In our region, the arts create almost $600 million a year in economic activity, supporting more than 19,000 jobs, generating almost $60 million for state and local governments, 
with almost 12 million annual arts-related visits. That's more than all St. Louis sporting events combined. Whether in a park, on a street, or a wall, experimental or a classic, the arts deserve our support because the arts help support us. HEC Media is proud to be our region's home for arts, education, and culture. Because in St. Louis, the arts mean business. What? Cut it. You got to do like, cut it like a yeah. round. I agree. Like, yeah. I'll do one round side, and then I'll do another round Maybe side. And with... oh, we have kind of three pillars to our mission statement. So the first is equipping artists. The second is empowering youth. And the third is engaging community. So we're interested in how do the arts help us better express ourselves and giving kids tools to you know, deeply express their ideas and positively express their ideas I think is a really important thing to do. 10 years ago, I was graduating my MFA program at WashU and um, I was a member at Holy Cross Lutheran across the street. And they had, at the time, a lot of vacant real estate. And so I approached them about setting up camp in one of the classrooms as a studio space. So I was making stuff and there were a lot of kids that played in the parking lot in the yard and made a lot of mischief. We started doing more research and found out that it's the most densely populated neighborhood uh, with children in the city. So that's how the kids stuff sort of got rolling. We, we started then with like a just once a week afternoon class in the summers. That got rolling and grew even bigger. We started a full-fledged after-school program then um, for local public schools. Now that's grown into after-school programs, in-school arts integrated education, and then a teen summer apprenticeship program. Five years ago, we were approached, or six now, approached by Lutheran Development Group, and they said, what do you think about a public charter coming into the old school building that we were using and turning this space that we're currently standing in um, into Intersect Art Center and uh, becoming a nonprofit and sort of formalizing the whole thing. So we went forward with that and we had kind of the coming of age and went from being a project into sort of an organization. And here we are. That's a little bit of our, our backstory. We kind of work with all age groups. Uh, we work with kids K through eight and some high school kids as well. And then we have, we offer adult classes. So, you know, that varies from like 18 to 18 and up. We do after school programming, arts after school programming, and we work with Momentum Academy and Kairos. Uh, they're two schools in the neighborhood and they send their kids over for after school programming at Intersect. We have morning extracurricular classes that we do for Momentum Academy. Within that, we have a gardening class, a yoga and movement class, an art class, and a cooking class. And we offer after school classes, and that's visual art, cooking, ceramics, music, photo, dance, yoga and movement. The youth that are in our programs are all primarily within walking distance of Intersect, so it's this like very close zip code that we serve. One of the positive impacts is that there is accessible art programming in the community because of Intersect, meaning that like children can come to the free summer camp and kids can come to the after school program and adults can come to like adult art classes. Just having a space where people can come and do art, I feel like positively impacts the community. Like South City doesn't really have another art space. And so I think having this in this community is really important. I hope they take away just feeling like that they're capable of making art and being artists. I think that being able to come and do art every week and every day helps them build confidence in their creative skills. I think there's, you know, lots of stories you can tell about how the kids feel like this is a really good place for them and that's really good to see. Scan the QR code on your screen to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. These women from all walks of life are breaking stereotypes of older women thanks to photographer Kathy Lander Goldberg. Her newest social photography and storytelling project, Wise Women, Resilient Lives, showcases the dynamic stories of women over 70. We call it social because not only are they sharing their stories with their friends, but we're putting it out into the world so other people can learn from them. I want this project to say, we are aging, but we are still living our lives exuberantly and the way we want to. Projects such as this allows people to look at, uh, in this case, women as they move into their 
uh, late 70s and 80s and beyond to see that people's lives are vibrant and that people continue to be active mem members of the community. I thought it would be a good way to sum up my life and to meet with other women who were my age, older, younger, and who were also still active, still themselves. It's an unfortunate reality that in our society, older women often experience ageism, a stereotype that this project aims to dispel. As people get older, right, they may experience losses, but how do they keep going? I am obsessed with the topic of healthy aging. I'm now 78, starting from about the age of 65 on, I realized I was happier than I had ever been. That was unexpected. And then what was even more surprising was that as I began to read about aging, I discovered that my experience was typical. But when I talk to people my age, and I say I work with senior citizens, they immediately think of like a, a nursing home kind of a environment and there's just so much more to it. I came here with a whole group of friends and these women dance every Friday. So it's a different time of life. It's not really the, the end of life. So what does it take to be a wise, resilient woman? So the resilience part comes in never quitting what you actually want to achieve. Now I'm embarking into a new career, which is writing. Growing old gracefully. Growing old comfortably. Growing old beautifully. Those attributes have always been my desire. I hope to be gaining wisdom as I go along, <laughs> learning from other people, growing in my understanding, and I'm always exploring. So that's probably in the category of wise. Resilient because we either pick ourselves up and move ahead or we're in a place we really don't want to be. Out of a lifetime of stories, these women chose what is most meaningful to them for their photo essays. I wrote about experiencing gratitude in my later years. I have been so grateful that I've lived this long, that I've had the opportunity to, in a way, live a second life beyond retirement. My story is all about getting the message out. In 1975, I was diagnosed manic depressive, which is called bipolar now. But what is wonderful for me and wonderful to be part of this group was to be able to get my story out again and let it go to different people because with mental illness, one person has to start a conversation. I chose to talk about how my role as an educator, which really is intertwines everything that I've done for probably 50 years or more, but always the end goal was that what I do makes a difference. After participating, this group of women found this project more meaningful than they ever imagined. What it gives to me is, at this time in my life, it's not me, but it's the message that you can live a strong and, and resilient life. It's one of the best experiences I've had in my life. My hope is that this project helps older women feel heard. We're not done yet. It may take us a little longer, but we're not done yet. Here, here. Yeah. HEC has been bringing you positive programming and award-winning content for decades. Arts, education, culture, in-depth discussions, films, and more. All in one place. HECmedia.org. On any given evening, you'll find dozens of college students tossing around frisbees under the lights on Washington University's South Campus Field. But they're not playing any kids game. This is Ultimate Frisbee. Frisbee is kind of a fun place where everyone's really accepting and welcoming. And I think that is nice to create an environment where you feel like no pressure 
but at the same time you can play competitively and seek to like be the best you can on the field. So there's two men's teams, two women's teams, and we're very social with one another, so we don't really play together, although sometimes we'll do little scrimmages. <laughs> Team members come from a wide variety of backgrounds, be it geographically, overall interests in majors, and even their experience with Ultimate Frisbee prior to joining the team. I actually went through all of high school never having like touched a frisbee, picked up a frisbee. I really didn't know this was a competitive sport, so I never really played coming in. I actually showed up to the club sports fair. Like my first week here, didn't know what I was gonna do. I ran track in high school, but didn't decide to continue. Um, and I saw at the, uh, the club fair, I saw a group of guys and they had a stick with a frisbee on it. Our captain um, has been playing since I think fifth grade, um, and so she has years and years more of experience than me. But people do a really good job of working with people who are newer um, to the sport and trying to kind of help them adjust to how to play ultimate frisbee. Strong fight! Randy! Fast fight! Murphy! Randy! Randy! Murphy! Randy! Murphy! Fuck the Tiger! Whoop! Whoop! We grew up in a town that frisbee was invented in. It was invented at our high school in our senior parking lot, so it's always been a huge, huge part of our lives and like my whole family um, is really into it, played throughout high school, throughout the summers. I love teaching new players and there are often times like athletes that come from other sports that end up becoming the best players too. In terms of like comparing it to basketball, I feel like it has the same level of competition, but honestly, I feel like everyone just has more fun with it. But beyond the competitive nature of the game, the biggest benefit, and surprise for many of the players, is what happens off the field. We're a team that's here for each other, and we're a team that's here to have fun, and we're a team that's supposed to support each other no matter what. So if we can't make practice because we're struggling or we have schoolwork to do, they say, you know, that's totally fine. You have to make sure that you and your community are healthy before we even worry about a competitive sport. Practices, you know, we're spending a lot of time with each other, but we still seek each other outside of practice and spend a lot of time with each other. Like every Friday, we have team dinner that we call LAMP, and we'll just cook up a big meal at our house that I live with a bunch of the guys, and we'll just invite the entire team over, and we can have upwards of like 20 people from the team, sometimes more. <laughs> so we have to cook quite a bit of food, but uh, we'll just have dinner, watch sports, hang out, and just enjoy each other's company. There is something just so special about the people. My like best friends at college, um, so many of them play frisbee. I we hang out all the time. Um, men's team, women's team, A team, B team. Um, every day I'm spending time with Frizzy people. We're tossing on the field. It's just really like the best community ever and it's like made my college experience what it is. It would actually be a completely different experience without Frisbees. Next week, super superintendents. How these educators help students and win awards. Plus, author Sally Hepworth talks her latest novel, The Soulmate, A Murderous Love Story. Thanks for watching Spotlight. Join us next Sunday at 9.30 a.m. on KPLR 11.